Okay, let's start with today's talk. So most of the developers um, like to use some new technologies. And these guys, <laughs> they used um, some older technology, as, and as they say, for, for a good reason. Uh, we have Ricardo and Jorit from the Netherlands today here with us. And they will talk about Kotlin. They like to call themselves hipsters and Kotlin a hipster's language. So let's see what they have for us today. Guys, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Um, yes, OK. So welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Ricardo Lipulis. This is my colleague, Jorit van der Ven. Uh, we work at JDriven, which is a small consultancy uh, firm in the Netherlands. Um, and we would like to share our experiences of using Kotlin um, for uh, about a year now um, and hopefully trigger you into joining the Kotlin uh, community. So f let me start with a disclaimer. We are not Kotlin experts yet. I mean, we've been developing Kotlin for uh, almost a year now. Um, we still learn new things every day. We're not really using the, like the hardcore language features of Kotlin yet, but we do have a lot of experiences uh, which we think might be of interest to you. Um, if you're in the same state as we were about a year ago, in which um, we had some, um, we had read something about Kotlin, we did some workshops, and we didn't know if it was a good match to actually start using it in a production environment. So the agenda for today, we're going to start with a bit of context of our project and what we're working on, our day-to-day -day environment. Uh, after that, we're going to discuss the pros and cons, um, divided in three, in, in three uh, separate areas, starting with the language aspects, followed by the library and framework support, and uh, followed by the tooling support. And in the end, we're going to give you some lessons learned and tips that we wish we would have had a year ago. So, as I said, we work at JDriven, but currently we're doing a project at the, the port of Rotterdam, one of the largest ports in the world and largest one in Europe. Um, as you can see, we have a nice the skyline of Rotterdam. Um, it's a very nice view, very nice office to work at. Um, the cruise ships arrive a few times a week, and sometimes the cruise ships are so big that they actually block our view out of uh, looking outside, so then we have to go to an upper floor to get coffee, of course. Um, so the department we're working at is uh, a pretty innovative IT department at the Port of Rotterdam, cons considering the port is a very large and slow organization. Um, and we're building software for ports all around the world, actually. We're trying to create a sort of network of smart, connected ports all over the world. Um, and we're not there yet by a long shot, but we're getting there. We do some pretty cool projects. So one of the projects we're working on now it's uh, called Navigate, and basically what we do is we create an application for shippers and forwarders to plan their container routes. So I'm going to give you a quick demo, if it's loading. Yes. So basically, if you have a cargo, you want to transport it, say, from Tokyo to Sohar, you can use our application to see the most optimal route for your container. And of course, the definition of optimal depends on your wishes. You can like you see the, the, the fastest or the most uh, environmentally neutral uh, trip. Um, so it's like a, a path-finding uh, application, finding the shortest route to your destination. You may applaud if you like it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have one fan. Um, so as with any typical IT project, uh, we had a tight deadline from the start. We had about two months until the first deadline was there. Um, so we didn't have a lot of room to experiment. Um, but the department gives us a lot of freedom in deciding which technologies to use. So we decided to use Neo4j, which is a graph database to do the uh, finding the optimal path of the route. Um, but uh, with the la uh, programming language, we had a choice between two options, Scala or Kotlin. Those were the two languages already used in the department. Um, I already had some experience with, with Scala. I did some workshops. Um, 
So I decided we should use Kotlin. Um, and Jordan is now going to give us some pros and cons. Yes. <coughs> um, well, let's get started with, I think, the first pro uh, of Kotlin, and that is compile time, null safety. Um, when we um, got Java 8, um, they gave us the optionals and stuff like Lambdas and stuff. Um, and the optional promised us uh, no more null pointer exceptions. But actually, uh, I think they made it worse because all of a sudden, now you got three options when you call the method. Either an option with a value, an empty optional, or still null because the compiler still allows that. Um, in Kotlin, they basically built the uh, whole optional construction in the language itself. So by default, um, you can't return null from a method. So as you can see in the uh, example here, um, if you want to return null, you have to explicitly state that by adding a question mark behind the um, return type. Um, and the compiler will just verify that. So if you don't do that, uh, your code just won't compile if you want to, to return null. Um, also, if you want to call a method on something that is nullable, you have to make that explicit by adding a question mark to the method call. That's called the uh, null safe call function. Um, otherwise, again, your code won't compile. Um, and they added the Elvis operator. Uh, that is uh, this thing here. If you put it on the side, it looks like Elvis. Um, and that basically says, well, if there's a value on the left side, return that, and otherwise return the uh, alternative. So in this case, uh, we try to find a hipster from a database. Well, there's always a chance you can't find someone with that name. In that case, uh, return a not found. Um, so is this completely foolproof? Um, well, yes, if you uh, are using pure Kotlin code, but yeah, we're in a Java ecosystem, and uh, there's always a chance that you'll interface with some older Java language uh, library. And in that case, of course, because Java doesn't have this uh, uh, null types, null, null safety, um, Kotlin doesn't know if something is null or not, and uh, yeah, in that case, it, it just assumes something is nullable. Um, and in that case, you can use uh, the, the bang bang operator, it's called, this, this one. Um, and it basically means, well, co compiler, trust me, I know this won't ever be null. Um, and then it just will assume it won't be null. Um, of course, it still can be null, and then it will throw a Kotlin null pointer exception. So, yeah, it's not a Java null pointer exception anymore. So, in that uh, object, the right. Um, also, something we really liked is the data classes. Um, are there any Java developers here? Ah, mm -hmm. almost everyone, as far as I can see. <laughs> Does ever, uh, someone of you ever used uh, something like Lombok or Immutables? Ah, great. Also, almost everyone. Um, so that's a great library, right? It saves you from writing a lot of boilerplate codes. No more equals, hash code, two strings. Uh, and basically, they put that concept into Kotlin itself. So if you declare a class as a data class, uh, you only have to declare the properties. And by default, it will generate an immutable class with all the equals, hash code, two strings. And it will even generate uh, stuff like uh, copy constructors or modifying copy constructors, et cetera. So that's really cool. Um, it it works properly with uh, stuff like JPA and Jackson. Uh, however, we did find some problems with, for example, spring configuration properties, because yeah, it tries to do some reflection magic and in some way it isn't compatible with Kotlin. And we had some problems with the Neo4j object graph mapper, but they fixed that a couple of weeks ago. So that's um, actually working pretty well now. So a small pop quiz. Uh, this is our quiz, quiz master, <laughs> Ricardo. <laughs> Ricardo. Thank you. Yes. OK, so we have this piece of code here. And the question for you is, what will happen here? So basically, we have a, a null string and a non-null string. And we call the equals method on the null string, giving as a parameter the non-null string. And we uh, then print the result. So what do you think will happen here? So the options are A, compile error, B, runtime exception, like null pointer exception, or C, it prints, are they equal, false. So Show of hands, who think it's A? You see the hands? <laughs> yeah, I see two hands. <laughs> two hands, OK. Who think it's B? Uh, two, hands, two hands, three hands. Who think it's C? OK, the most of you think it's C. Well, that's, uh, 
Perfect. Um, we have indeed. to come up with a better question. I Sorry? Think. We have to come up with a better qu question, yeah. I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so coming from a Java world, this might be a bit mind-blowing, but if you have already read some stuff about Kotlin, you might have already figured it out. Um, the equals function is uh, not the same as the equals function in uh, Java, and it's the equals function is actually a so-called extension uh, function on the string class. And not just on the string class, but actually on a nullable string. So that means that the equals method can be called on an object that is null. And as you see in the first uh, line of the uh, function, if this equals null, and it's a triple uh, equal sign, which means reference equality, um, then it only verifies if the other uh, object is null as well. So yeah, this equals null, that's yeah, something you don't uh, see in Java, but in Kotlin it's possible. So yeah, extension methods are pretty cool, extension functions. Um, you can compare them to using uh, utility functions in, in Java, like adding extra functionality to a class, um, but with the difference that you can actually call the method on the object itself. So you can add methods to a class from outside of that class, which is pretty cool. It can uh, cause better readability, um, and you can add some very useful extension functions. Uh, some of them are already present uh, by default in the Kotlin language. We'll see a few of them later on as well. But for example, in this case, the take if method um, takes a predi predicate, and if the predicate is true, returns the object that the take if method was called on. And if false, it returns null. So you can, in a sort of like a builder pattern style, you can um, chain method calls uh, to get your result, in which in with normal Java code, it would take more lines. Um, the downside is sometimes you're tr try just trying to figure out, OK, where does this method come from? Um, the, the IDE helps you a lot in uh, like with the autocomplete, but even IntelliJ sometimes has some difficulty trying to scan your entire code base, trying to find all the extension functions that are present. So it does cause a bit of slowness, but it's pretty cool to have it. So one uh, particular example which I would like to share with you where uh, extension functions or actually extension properties were very useful was in uh, Spring Data Neo4j, which is the Spring Data layer between the Neo4j graph and your uh, Spring application. Um, the Spring Data Neo4j uh, library has a, a class called point, which is basically just a point in a two-dimensional um, coordinate system. So it has an x and a y. Um, and we were using that class to do uh, mappings with geographical coordinates, so latitude, longitude. And of course, you can imagine, like, uh, well, in your day-to-day -day work, you always trying to f remember whether x was latitude or longitude or was it the other way around. And Sometimes they even differ across libraries <laughs> to, make, to make things worse. Yeah, so it's uh, very error prone and can cause some hard to find bugs. So what we did basically in the end was define two extension properties on the point class, one called lat and one called lng, and which basically just mapped to the correct property, the x and the y. So through our code base, we could just call uh, .lat or .long on uh, a point class and we'd get the correct one back. So that was pretty cool. So um, yeah, one minor addition. Uh, Neo4j object graph mapper also has a point class in which the x and y are actually reversed. So a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I can go on and on, but <laughs> <laughs> let's look at some more cool Kotlin features. Yeah. Um as I mentioned earlier, since Java 8, um, Java is getting more and more uh, functional programming um, yeah, paradigms implemented into Java. And in Kotlin, they did that from the start, but I think they did it a better way. Um, so, so with Java 8, we could finally write something like this. Um, we could just write, create a, um, a stream of integers, uh, multiply them, and then collect them, and then we got a list of multiplied integers. OK, nice. But this is pretty readable, right? Um, well, in Kotlin, you can write it like this, which I think is a lot cleaner, because Kotlin has support for ranges out of the box. Um, and you don't have to create a stream or something like that from that. 
you can just call all the map filter uh, functions directly on every collection. So uh, as you can see, this is just really clean and really easy to read, at least that's what I think. Um, then there are some things uh, I personally don't like in Kotlin. Um, for example, uh, you don't have statics in Kotlin. Well, you do have them, but they're called a companion object, which you can uh, define in your class. Uh, and everything you put there is basically a static. But yeah, most of the time, you're only adding a logger, for example, to your class. And that would mean that now you have to write three lines of code instead of one. So mm, I don't like it. Um, also, I think when you start with Kotlin, constructor overloading can be a bit confusing because uh, your default constructor is directly in the class declaration, so as you can see over here. Um, and if you want to overload it, you have to define uh, additional constructor blocks, uh, which call this, um, and then you have to uh, overload it like that. Mm. Uh, also, you can't add any code to your uh, constructors. In Java, you can. In Kotlin, you have to use init blocks. Well, I'm not sure what you think about init blocks in Java, but I think nobody likes them. And in Kotlin, it's basically the only way to add code to something like constructor-like uh, construct. So that's something we didn't really like. Um, also, when you um, start with Kotlin, there's a, a lot of new stuff to learn, which is good because, well, Kotlin contains a lot of new cool features. But um, when you try to look up a method signature from uh, a method you don't know, you might uh, find something like this. And there are a lot of keywords that were new to us. So like uh, public, OK, I understand that. But then inline and refight and something within and blah de blah de blah I don't know what it means. So yeah, this really increases the, um, the learning um, what did you call curve. It? Sorry? Learning curve? Yeah, the learning <laughs> curve. <laughs> Um, so yeah, a lot of new features, but also that means a lot of new stuff to learn. Ricardo? Yeah, so uh, you had already mentioned the coolness of just calling the map and the filter operations directly on your uh, collections without having to create a stream first. Um, that's pretty cool. It really uh, reduces the, uh, yeah, the, the amount of lines of code you have to write, you know, like, uh, like uh, dot .stream and then collect to list. You can just directly call map, filter, etc. on the collection. Um, the difference between the Java streaming uh, API and these kinds of uh, functions is that Java streaming API is, of course, lazy. So it only starts collecting, like actually doing the, performing the operations you define when you collect the stream into another collection or whatever. Um, but in Kotlin, if you call a map or a filter on a collection, it actually directly creates a new collection um, with the elements um, like, uh, from the resulting of the operation you, you performed on the, on the collection. So in this case, we call developers.filter, and we say, OK, every developer that has a, a Kotlin language skill. Um, so the hipsters uh, variable actually directly contains, is, is a new list, a copy, uh, containing only the elements matching the predicate. So if afterwards you add something to the developers list, of course the, the hipsters list isn't modified because it's just a separate list. So that's, um, yeah, in many cases that's fine. Uh, but sometimes you do multiple operations on collection, like you, you have uh, like a chaining call, um, or you operate on a large collection. So that you. Sometimes you, you have the, the need to do it more in a lazy way. You know? So Kotlin does have support for that as well. It's called sequences. Um, they m resemble the Java streaming API a bit more in the sense that they are also lazy and only when you start iterating a sequence does it uh, actually execute all the steps in the sequence. Um, but there's one difference. Uh, the sequence can actually be iterated multiple times. So you can, you can reuse a sequence. Basically, every time you iterate a sequence, it creates a new iterator and iterates the, like, executes the steps in the filter and map operation again. So in this case, um, we convert the developer's collection to a sequence, and we call filter.map, and at this point, still nothing happened. 
uh, but when we call the average method, then it starts to iterate. So if we take um, take the code from here and add this to uh, like assign this to a variable, then every time we iterate or uh, over that uh, collection, it actually reflects the actual elements in the developer's uh, collection. So this can be convenient, but you have to be aware of the differences between sequences and collections and when to use one or the other. Um, the Java streaming API has uh, support for parallelism uh, out of the box. You know, you can create parallel streams. Uh, the Kotlin collections do not. However, um, there is another aspect of Kotlin which you can use if you want to do more parallel stuff, and that's called coroutines. And they're pretty cool. Um, it's a pretty big subject, so yeah, you can give an entire talk about coroutines, and maybe still people won't understand it, so I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Uh, basically, it allows you to do parallel tasks um, in an easy way um, without having to regard much about the low-level uh, aspects of um, asynchronous code. So you don't need to manage threads or thread pools. Basically, you say um, that you want to have a piece of code executed asynchronously. And of course, you can tune some, some stuff to make it work in the way you want, but it's a very uh, easy way to parallelize your code. Um, it uses the concept of fibers. I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, actually, yesterday at the talk from uh, Heather Van Kuren, it was mentioned that Java is actually working on uh, Project Loom, which basically involves the same concepts as used here in uh, coroutines, um, but Kotlin already has it, so you can already start using it. And if you already have some asynchronous code, for example, uh, completable futures in Java or using a reactive library such as RxJava or Project Reactor, you can also interoperate with Kotlin coroutines, which is pretty cool. Um, as with all asynchronous code, testing coroutines may be hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, support for that is getting better and better by the day. So just a simple example. Um, say we have a very expensive calculation. Uh, we have a function which takes an integer and multiplies it by two. We all know how hard that can be. Um, say we want to do that asynchronously. Now, to, to create an asynchronous version of this function, basically we can define an async function which, instead of an int, returns a deferred int. Um, it looks a lot like future, um, and basically it's the same concept but a bit simpler. Um, and in that uh, function, we define uh, an async code block in which we call our actual function. Now, to use that, uh, say we have a main function, um, we do a calculation, async, of the large number 1, 2, 3. Um, and in this case, I call a run blocking block because uh, async functions can only be called from uh, asynchronous concept, uh, context, basically. Um, so in practice, you wouldn't call run blocking because you want to like, prevent blocking your threads. But in this case, just to get the result quicker, we can use it. Um, and we call the await function on the async, uh, on the deferred. And if the result is available, it will return uh, and print the result in the end. So. Um, you, you don't see anything regarding threat management or calling executor services, whatever. And basically, the idea is that you shouldn't care about on, uh, which thread this is being executed. So if the um, underlying coroutine code decides it might be better to just execute it on the same thread, that might happen. So that's a pretty powerful concept and enables you to create uh, asynchronous code more easily. So say we have a list of uh, numbers, and we want to call the expensive calculation on all these numbers. We can just convert this into a collection of uh, deferreds. We see the, the range operator, the numbers 1 to 1,000, and we map that to a deferred uh, calculation. And then there's a await all method, which is actually an extension function on the Kotlin collection class of a collection of deferreds. And if all the results are available, then you will get the result, and we can call sum on it. Yeah, so let's switch over to some um, 
uh, the integration aspects of Kotlin. Um, well, we used Spring for our uh, project, and integration between Kotlin and Spring was just great. Um, yeah, Kotlin really is a first-class citizen of the Spring framework. Um, if you use Spring Initializer, you can just generate a project uh, using Kotlin. Um, they have some extension functions, especially for interoperability with Spring, for example, in Spring Data JPA. Um, and they even provided a special plugin for Maven or uh, Gradle to automatically open up your classes. And that means um, in Java, by default, your classes are open, and you have to explicitly declare them final. In Kotlin, it's the other way around. By default, your classes are final. Um, but of course, because Spring uses um, all kinds of reflection magic, uh, it needs to open up these classes. Uh, and you can do that by, uh, by hand, or you can use the uh, plugin, which automatically does it for you. Um, there is one problem with that plugin, and that, um, that is that when you, let's see, oops, when you uh, initialize a spring bean uh, via a configuration uh, class, then the plugin won't always detect that uh, spring bean. So in this example, um, we have a class called some service, and it uses a micrometer annotation, and that's not a spring annotation, so the plugin won't uh, detect that. Um, and your code will just compile uh, perfectly, but when you start uh, running it, it will just crash horribly. Um, and you t the first time you encounter this, it will take you several hours to debug, and then finally you, you figure out what's going on. You add the open statement uh, operator to the class, and then all of a sudden everything starts working again. So, um, yeah, that's basically the only disadvantage I think um, there is, because, yeah. The rest just works great. Um, yeah, I think this was yours. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, another cool feature of Kotlin is that you can actually use sentences as function and class names. Uh, I don't recommend just using it all over your code base, but especially in test cases, uh, it can be pretty convenient to give your test uh, a very uh, clear name of like what the test expects of the result. Um, so as you can see here, the class is actually called, this is a useless test, and the test is, um, well, just describes what it should do, which is pretty cool. Um, so if you're used to using um, like JUnit and Mockito, then actually it works all perfectly in, in, uh, in Kotlin, so that's pretty fine. Uh, there's one minor thing, like the Kotlin, uh, no, uh, Mokito obviously uses the, the when uh, method to define the behavior of your mocks. Um, but when is a reserved keyword in Kotlin, so yeah, that clashes. So there's a way around that. You can use uh, the Mokito Kotlin uh, plugin or like library, which adds some helper functions to bridge uh, Mokito to Kotlin. Um, so then you have a whenever function, which does the same as when. So just a minor thing, but yeah, it works uh, pretty good. So yeah, the idea support is pretty uh, good in IntelliJ. Uh, obviously, Kotlin is developed by JetBrains, so JetBrains would want to make sure that you use IntelliJ. Um, um, the ID actually gives you a lot of warnings and hints to help you uh, create the optimal uh, Kotlin code. Of course, it also has the automatic conversion feature, so if you paste Java code into a Kotlin file, it automatically converts to uh, Kotlin code, um, and then immediately gives warnings on how to improve the code, so I'm like, yeah, why don't you just immediately improve it? But, um, so yeah, learn the language by examining these IDE hints and warnings. So say we have this horrible piece of code in which we have uh, some a uh, variable which is of type any, which basically is like object in Java. And we have, um, we want to know what type of variable that is. Um, so if, if it's an int, we say, well, it's a number. If it's a string, we say, hey, it's a string. Uh, so you already see a lot of the, the squiggly lines saying, like, hey, this code can be better. So if we just apply all the, the conversions that uh, IntelliJ offers us, in the end, the code, still horrible, but a lot, lot less horrible, and in a Kotlin way, uh, converts it to a when uh, expression, um, and yeah, it looks a lot, lot cleaner. 
Um, you do notice that the IDE support is not m as mature as uh, the support for Java yet. Um, sometimes it's a bit slow. On my machine, it's a bit slower than on his machine. Um, sometimes you have weird errors. Um, I just submit all those errors to JetBrains, and I have noticed that the errors are getting less and less. I mean, the last error has been a while back now, so it's, I think they're really uh, working hard on all my bug reports. So it's getting better and better, but it's, it's still not at the same level as the Java support. But yeah, yeah let's uh, see some cool features. I <laughs> think uh, these were the most important features, but we have some other smaller features that really just make your life a lot easier. Um, for example, string literals. Now, since Java 13, we have them in Java as well. I think since last week, that is. Um, but in Kotlin, they, they also have some nice extension methods to the string uh, literals, like uh, trim indent, which automatically removes well, um, this part <laughs> from your string. So this is especially useful if you are using s small pieces of JSON in your unit test, for example. Um, Autocasting, well, actually, Ricardo uh, basically showed it a, just a little bit in the previous example. But in Kotlin, if you as a programmer know that something is of a certain type, then the compiler will know it as well. So in this case, um, I have a variable num, which is declared as a nullable number. Uh, and then in the when statement, if I say, well, if it's a double, then I don't have to cast it to a double anymore because, yeah, well, the compiler just knows it because you already checked it. So you can directly call all the methods of a double on that object. Same for a long, and it also knows that it is not nullable because, yeah, it is a double, otherwise it would be null. So that's really useful and just makes your code a lot easier to read. Um, default method parameters, also very nice. Um, if you want to uh, create an overloaded version of your uh, method because well, you forgot something maybe, uh, then you don't uh, need to have to write another uh, method. You can just add uh, another parameter with a default value. And I know there are other languages who understand it as well. For example, I think PHP. But now we have this uh, in Kotlin as well. Um, and as you can see, you can reference um, those parameters by name. Um, and that's also really useful, of course, if you have a method with like six int arguments then you can just add the name and you know which uh, value is for what. Um, yeah, the structuring variables, it's also nice. So in case you have a, uh, an object person uh, and you just want to extract the name and age, using this construction you can just directly um, uh, get these values out of these objects and put them in another variable. Um, and this doesn't only work for objects, but this also works for uh, collections like lists and um, pairs. We actually have a tuple in Kotlin. That's really cool. I always miss that thing in the standard Java library. Um, and especially with lists and uh, pairs, I think this is really useful. Um, uh, yes, and if, try, and when are expressions in Kotlin. So uh, you can directly return a value from your if or your else and assign it to a variable. Um, I think this is active in Java 13 as well. It was experimental in Java 12. Um, but yeah, Kotlin has it for a few years now. Uh, and it just makes your code more compact, easier to read. Uh, operator overloading. Um, yeah. In uh, Java, you, there was an overloaded version of the plus for, to add strings together. In Kotlin, you can add basically everything together with a, a plus statement. So if you have two lists, you can merge them with plus. Uh, and you can also define your own overload. So uh, for all the Scala developers out here, I know you love this kind of stuff. Uh, so now you can. You can even probably change the plus into a minus if you really want to. So finally, our lessons learned. Yes. Um. As we notice, it's very easy to start with Kotlin. You know, you get this automatic co conversion feature. The, the IDE helps you a lot, uh, and basically, we like the language because it's uh, very, uh, it's pragmatic in many ways. Um, we do recommend f some functional programming experiences. I mean, it's obviously an object-oriented language, but it contains a, long, a lot of functional principles. It's not a purely functional language, um, but 
having this functional experience really helps you in writing better Kotlin code. So the, before using Kotlin, I once did a, a course on Coursera about functional programming in Scala, and there were a lot of these concepts. I, I didn't even know what the guy was talking about uh, often, but you know, in the end, I really learned a lot about the functional principles, uh, and that helped me a lot in learning how to write proper Kotlin code. So that's strongly recommended. Um, another tip we want to give you is to start small. You know, just start with a hobby project or and just try to experiment with it and not immediately start converting your whole legacy code base into Kotlin. Um, if you don't have time to work on a separate project, you can, of course, just start converting small parts of your application. Um, you can start recommending by, for example, first start using Kotlin data classes as your entity or your model, uh, and then just gradually expand uh, the Kotlin code base inside your code base. Um, if you want to learn using Kotlin in a, in a fun way, we recommend the EduTools plugin from IntelliJ. Um, basically, it gives you a series of cones, uh, like small tasks, which you need to complete, and it um, gives you a starting point, and you know, in this case, you have to implement the to-do, of course. It gives you a description of what to do, it gives you some links to helpful uh, um, yeah, in websites where the concepts are explained, and it's a really fun way of getting to know the, the basics of Kotlin. So much recommended if um, you're interested in using Kotlin. So thank you. Uh, I think we have some time for questions, if anybody... Uh, has any? I, I see, see a hand a over hand there. There, yeah. Test. Hi. So, uh, actually, I've got two questions. The the first one is, uh, what did your project end up looking at in terms of? Is it like ninety plus percent Kotlin? The rest is Java. Is it like a fifty fifty split? Or in did you split perhaps because Spring Data and Neo4j don't cope as well with Kotlin annotation-wise, node entity, repository, etc. So you can choose whether I ask my second question straight away or first you want to answer that. Uh, well, we'll start with the first question. Uh, so yeah, basically we try to do everything uh, backend related, of course, in Kotlin. So uh, our entire uh, backend applications are written in Kotlin. Um, the, we have some custom Neo4j procedures which run on the Neo4j graph, which we started out in Java, but uh, ultimately also decided to convert that to Kotlin, and it works perfectly as well. So we have Kotlin code running on the Neo4j database. Um, but of course, yeah, the front end obviously is, uh, is like React and other stuff, but the back end is fully uh, written in Kotlin now. Yeah, I think the only and mistake we made was uh, to build uh, our Gradle build file in Kotlin as well. Yeah. <laughs> It's really <laughs> slow, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, the second question is, uh, how do you cope with uh, CI, CDI? Have you got like Jenkins, uh, I don't know, Sonar integration, for example? How does it cope with uh, code coverage? No um, yeah, so uh, we uh, built our stuff on Circle CI, and we have uh, also have it also linked to a Sonar source, uh, a Sonar Cube. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, well, it all has support for Kotlin. Um, the code coverage is also calculated correctly. Um, so yeah, we have not encountered any negative uh, stuff with that. Yeah, right? maybe uh, Findworks that didn't work. Uh, OK, yeah, Findworks, yeah. yeah. No. All right, thank you. I'll just stand there if I can see any other hands. Yes, I can see one in the back. Hello. Hi. Hi. I would blast you with a few questions real sure. quick. So I see many similarities to Groovy. So what would be? if you're aware, a uh, nasty difference between the Groovy and the Kotlin coming uh, from we, that. We, we kind of expected that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, there are a lot of similarities, uh, some minor differences in naming, but a lot of concepts are the same. Uh, what we found was that Kotlin uh, has a more pragmatic approach in that it, um, from the start, it's, it tried to integrate well with uh, the existing Java ecosystem. So I have no uh, direct experience with actually interoperating between Groovy and Java, but I know that Kotlin immediately wanted to do that right. Um, and since we're using Spring, Spring also uh, has a good interoperability with Kotlin in that it 
uh, made sure that you can use Kotlin code well to uh, use uh, well, to create a Spring application. Um, so yeah, I think the, the it's the focus in with which they started to develop Kotlin uh, that might be a bit different compared to Groovy, which maybe st started more of like a separate thing next to the Java. You know? Okay. Uh, next question: uh, Is it uh, so? There is a lot of vals, yes, and uh, it tends to resolve at least in uh, Java to a static type. Uh, so, is the same uh, thing in Kotlin, or as it, uh, as in Groovy, everything is an object? No, it's uh, resolved statically to to a, a certain type. Yes, yeah. so you can compare it to the the Java 10 var, um, but more than just uh, in a local uh, function code, you can use it all over your code base. But basically, what comes after the val, no, after the, the equals uh, sign, that determines the type of val. So if you have, for example, a member uh, on a class which you don't give uh, initial value, then you have to define the type explicitly. So what about it, lists? Sorry? What about lists? Lists, um, yeah, well, you, have to, uh, well you, can, you can, of course, create a list of any. Um, but if you say, for example, val uh, developers is list of, and then you give a bunch of strings, it will become a list of strings. Excellent. So it tries to find the common uh, type of all the elements in the list, and that will be the type of your list. Yeah, once generic it's type. a certain type, you can't change it anymore. So. No, that's true. That is really nice. So uh, for da uh, data class, is there a way to uh, specify uh, like from which fields do I want to uh, have hash uh, function and equals function generated, or do I have to override it uh, manually? Yeah, you, you have, have to override it, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah that's um. something I forgot to tell, but um, yeah, you have to override it, and especially if you're using JPA, um, I have to warn you, because if you are using uh, lazily initialized collections in combination with data classes in JPA, then it will include that lazily in, uh, uh, initialized uh, collection in your hash code as well, and that will just go horribly wrong. So. <laughs> In that case, uh, I recommend not using data classes or uh, manually overriding your hash code. But yeah, then basically and, and the whole data class doesn't yeah. really make sense anymore. So, any way to remove setters? Um, yeah. So if you define the uh, variables as val with the l, then it's on then it only gets a, a getter. If you define it as var, then it gets a getter and setter. So val always is immutable. Excellent. So uh, for uh, the sequences and uh, collection operations, so in Java streams, uh, they are composable. So you get uh, kind of one, one pass through a stream, and uh, each operation in chain executes with uh, some optimizations in the process. So is that true for, for Kotlin? Um, well, or yeah, you do can. It, does it loop uh, every time for each uh, cha uh, chain operation? Well, if you use sequences, then you can achieve exactly what you want. You can uh, like call a few operations on, on a sequence, and that will return a new sequence. But that doesn't mean that it's not iterated yet. So ultimately, when you start iterating the sequence or converting it to a list, then it will start performing all the operations. So you can have uh, like intermediate sequences uh, assigned to variables and then reuse them in different other, uh, like other sequences. Yeah, they're still lazy. Um, so. yeah. And if you uh, want to have an intermediate result and you actually want to see what's inside it, then you have to iterate it or collect it to a list. Uh, with uh, async, uh, the, the, the coroutines, uh, if, it, if used within sequences, uh, do they get triggered uh, only when the terminal operation is uh, executed, or can they be uh, running in the background while chain is being made? Um, yeah, it can be run in the background because the moment you uh, like call uh, like uh, call an async block, um, then it the idea is that you shouldn't care whether or not it's already being executed or not. Um, so that all depends on the, the the way you write your code. You can, for example, give uh, assign a certain context to your coroutines. You can say this is more like an I/O thing or a computational thing, or you can create your own context and. Ultimately, that determines when and on which thread or thread pool that's being executed. So um, technically, it might be executed directly. Um, so if you're using sequences, which may change later, um, 
it might not be a good idea to pass that to an async function if you don't know when it's going to be executed. Last question. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be support for Kotlin in other EDs? So, for example, Eclipse, if we do not can, uh, if we cannot pay, for example, for JetBrains and full support. I think, yeah, I think uh, the Kotlin supports also in the free version of IntelliJ. And uh, to be honest, uh, I haven't used Kotlin in either Eclipse or Net, uh, uh, NetBeans, so well, I, I, have I don't seen, know. Um, uh, we have given a Kotlin workshop uh, in the Netherlands, and there were some people using Eclipse, uh, and they could also just program in Kotlin. I, I wouldn't dare to compare the support. I think the support will be better in IntelliJ, to be honest. But I mean, it's workable uh, pretty good in Eclipse yes. as well. With the plugin. Thank you, guys. Okay. So Ricardo and Jorit will be around, so you can ask them questions. Yes. Yes. Outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.